Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jackie Mayer from MD Everywhere's credentialing team. Thank you for joining our Express webinar today. We have just 15 minutes, so please type your questions into the chat window, and I will respond to each one after the webinar. You'll also receive a copy of the recorded presentation, and it will be posted on our website and the MD Everywhere YouTube channel, so please follow us. Let's get started. Our topic, Medicare revalidations and update. Today we'll review why we're revalidating, how best to handle your revalidation, and we'll offer some advice from the trenches. We will conclude with some useful resources. First, why are Medicare and Medicaid enrollments being revalidated? The Affordable Care Act of 2010 included many fraud and abuse reduction efforts. And as we know, fraud and abuse drives up the cost of government programs. Revalidation is designed to prevent fraud and abuse in the first place. The ACA called for 1.5 million providers, meaning professional, institutional, and suppliers, enrolled after March of 2011 to be revalidated under new screening guidelines and for all new enrollments to meet these guidelines. Revalidation will re be repeated every five years for most providers and every three years for suppliers. However, all active providers and suppliers will need to be revalidated by March 23, 2015. Let's just call this Medicare recredentialing. One note, Medicaid enrollment must also be revalidated. But since each state will handle Medicaid enrollment in their unique ways, we will only address Medicare today. So what are the new screening guidelines? There are three categories of risk, which are based on historical fraud and abuse trends. First, the limited risk category. That includes, but not limited to, physicians and non-physician practitioners, medical groups or clinics, surgery centers, and certain facilities. The moderate risk category includes community mental health centers, comprehensive outpatient rehab facilities, hospice organizations, IDTFs, independent clinical laboratories, and non-public, non-government owned ambulance services. Finally, there is a high risk category. That includes home health agencies and suppliers of DME, prosthetics, orthotics, and supplies. Providers across all risk categories are subject to the general screening processes, including licensure verification and database cross-checks, like Social Security Administration, the OIG, and the NPI, NPI profile database. Moderate and high-risk categories can additionally be subject to pre- or post-enrollment site visits, which some of you have already experienced. Criminal background checks and fingerprinting are reserved for owners, managing employees, and providers in the high-risk category. So, is all of this worth it? Well, according to the February report, as of September 2015, more than 535,000 providers underwent revalidation. Over 225,000 have lost the ability to bill Medicare due to the Affordable Care Act requirements and other proactive initiatives. CMS has also revoked 14,663 providers and suppliers' ability to build the Medicare program. These providers were removed from the program because they had felony convictions, were not operational at the address that CMS had on file, or were not in compliance with the CMS rules. Not revalidating is considered non-compliance with the CMS rules, and I'm here to make sure you're in compliance. Now, We'll review the revalidation process and how you can avoid becoming disenrolled. First, let's look at the life cycle of a revalidation, which starts with CMS. CMS notifies, there we go, each intermediary of all NPIs that are due for revalidation. This list is made available on the CMS website, and we'll provide the link a little later on. The intermediary notifies all NPIs that are due for revalidation. I'm sorry, let me go back. 
The intermediary will use the correspondence address on the file to initiate the revalidation by letter, and follow-up attempts are made by calling and mailing subsequent letters. Depending on your Medicare file accuracy and your office's handling of the correspondence, the letter can go to a previous practice, can end up in the trash, or it can appropriately end up on your desk. Let's assume you receive your letter and your desk does not look like this. You now have your letter. Review your revalidation letter carefully. For the NPI being revalidated, as well as all PCANs connected to the NPI, either on the first page or the last page of the letter. Each P10 will need to be addressed on your response, and if any P10s are unfamiliar or inactive, you will need to deactivate them. Old P10 research has caused many delays for our clients. You will receive a separate revalidation if you're enrolled in more than one state or with multiple intermediaries. Each letter received does require a response. There is no fee for revalidating unless you're a supplier or an institutional provider. Direct revalidation using the PECOS database is fast and preferred. You'll need your NPI username and password to log on to PECOS. If you can't remember it, call NPPES and have the password reset. You will need to revalidate all PTANs in PECOS. If you're using paper, find the correct form and use the most current version. Upon receipt of the revalidation request, you have 60 days from the date of the letter to revalidate. A 60-day extension may be available if more time is needed to complete the process. Extension requests should be coordinated with your intermediary, and they may re be requested in writing, fax, email, or via phone. There are some restrictions, so please call and ask. Of course, old-school paper applications are accepted. Use the most current version of the application and attach your credentials. For individuals, a current state license registration, DEA, board certificate, or evidence of the highest level of training if you're not boarded, and a driver's license if born in the U.S., or a passport if not born in the U.S. There is no need to send a new EFT form or a group linkage form for revalidation. The exception is that if you have never enrolled in EFT, it's now mandatory. Make sure your name or the name, on, and, or the name on the application exactly matches the name on the NPI profile, the name listed with Social Security Administration for individuals, and with the IRS for groups. Do not fax paper applications because only original signatures will be accepted. Next, the intermediary processes the application and notifies you either of the approval or of an additional information or action needed. This is called the development letter. Once the paper application is approved, Medicare, your intermediary, will update PECOS. Revalidating in PECOS, though, reduces the time frame, and you can just log in to see the status. Now, congratulations if you've been revalidated. Until next time. Unless you've never received your letter or you did not respond, in which case you'll now be deactivated and your claims will not be paid. Hate to sound grim, but if your claims are not paying all of a sudden from Medicare, think revalidation and call your intermediary, ask them. Request a copy of the letter and get the application going immediately. Once the application is received and is in process, call the intermediary to request that the payment deactivation be lifted. Some will do this, others will not. Now, some hints and tips. First, you cannot send in an unsolicited revalidation application. If you're concerned that you may have missed a reval, call your intermediary armed with your NPI, your P10, and your tax ID number. CMS will send only one request regarding revalidation, and intermediaries have been instructed to place two telephone reminders. No reprieve is granted for entities that do not receive or respond to the request due to a bad address or faulty internal processes at your office. Payments will be suspended. Next, take the time to submit a clean application so your process will not be delayed. 
Zip codes must have the four number zip code extensions. The correspondent's contact telephone number must be valid. They will call to verify. If there's a checkbox at the end of any section related to the absence of sanctions, make sure you check those boxes. Copy the contact person page to include multiple staff members who may be helping you to call on the application status. They will only talk to the owner, manager, or the contact person on the application. Always scan the final application along with the cover letter prior to mailing it for your records. Remember, all sections applicable must be completed and signatures must be original and dated. Next, if you're using paper applications, send them via post office certified mail or another trackable shipping method. This one's important. As your practice changes, make sure Medicare always has current correspondence, pay to, and other addresses and information on file for your group. Submit a change application to update addresses, phone numbers, authorized and delegated officials, and group member linkages. Return mail will always result in a DNF or a do not forward. So claims payment can stop if you've changed your address and they can't get mailed to you. The DNF will be lifted once an application is processed to update the information. Finally, if somebody leaves your group, Send in an 855-R or go on PECOS to, re to remove that provider from your group. All of these maintenance activities will help ensure a smooth revalidation the next time around. Oh, if you were revalidated in 2011, your five-year clock is ticking and 2016 will be here before you know it. But if you followed all of our advice, it should be a piece of cake. Finally, please use PECOS. Thank you so much for your time today. We've included some resources here to provide additional information on background and process. The document you receive will have links activated for each of these items. We hope you found this information helpful. I'd like to just take a minute to talk about MD Everywhere. We're a leader in revenue cycle management technology, serving 7,000 physicians in over 40 specialties in multiple states. We have proven results in working with practices to increase collections and decrease denials. I'm especially proud of our top-notch credentialing services, featuring our NTQA certified CVO. Thanks for joining us today. We invite you to visit our website and to follow us on our social media. You'll always learn something from MD Everywhere. Thank you so much for your time today, and please enter your questions in the chat window or just email us and we'll answer them. Have a great afternoon.